Do we have a remote of any kind? Yeah, great. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, that's great. Now, before I get started, we are circulating some of these. Could you grab one and pass them along the line, please? Because it's important we have one each before I get started. So is everybody circulating those? Oh, I can see them, yes. Okay. Rightio. I'm going to stand over here for the minute and then move across because I'm, I'm a walker. I'm a, a, a person who walks around a lot when I speak. I'm really pleased to be here. Um, I've enjoyed Estonia. This is my first trip. And although I've not seen very much of it, I have interacted a lot with, with uh, the, the community here in the few opportunities I've had. And I very much enjoyed uh, the conversations. And the dinner last night was terrific. Thank you. I'm going to talk about student engagement for sustainability. But like Natalie, I'm not interested in talking too much. I'm more interested in an interaction. So please bear with me as we, I structure this presentation in a variety of ways. I want us to focus on the word engagement, please, student engagement. I'm coming from a set of glasses which are tinted with education for sustainable development. And specifically, I'm coming into the ESD room from a different place to some of the other speakers I heard in the opening day. In the opening day, we had a really good context of what sustainable development could mean and how complex it is to define it. We also had a review of some of the potential indicators that could help us ascertain whether we're heading in the right direction or not. And we had some very interesting conceptual presentations as well from our local colleague about the deep ecological, spiritual and uh, engagement with sustainable development and the possibility of reorienting those rivers through a mere trigger or catalytic impact of a change. All of that's really important to this presentation too. As we enter the room of ESD, we enter it via different doors. And the door that I'm entering is through education. I have a passion for education, and I believe that ESD is critical to changing education, as much as it is about changing our societies and our future. So when we, I have conversations with a lot of passionate SD people, sustainable development people, they talk about the future, they talk about the concepts, they talk about the indicators. But underpinning all of that has to be some questions and thought about the role our schools, our universities, our colleges, our NGOs engaged in learning processes, their role in all of this and how learning is actually the process by which we attain sustainable development. Because ultimately, we don't know what sustainable development looks like. We do not have a map, we do not have a recipe, we do not have a country we can imitate because it doesn't exist. But we all believe that we need to move in that direction. So that, what does that mean? It means we have to learn our way to sustainable development. We cannot just implement it. We have to learn our way to get there. And what that means is that education is the most important component of the attainment of sustainable development. But simultaneously, education is part of the problem. At the same time, we have an education system that reproduces the type of thinking, the type of relationships that exploit our people and our planet because education is just reproducing, it's transmitting thinking and ways of doing things. So here we have this paradox, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about unleashing the power of education. I want to talk about the changes in education that we need to make that, those steps much closer to a sustainable development 
world or country or process or community. And to me, student engagement is the poorest at the moment of our advances in sustainable development. When I was doing some research for a, a chapter I was writing, I was collecting evidence, I was talking to people, I was looking at the experiences. And student engagement is like here compared to all the other efforts we've been putting into education for sustainable development. So, very quickly, we have to have education in change, we need to look at learning, and most importantly, we need to look at pedagogy, the teaching and learning process. And that's what my talk's going to be about. But really, I need your engagement. I can't talk about engagement if I can't engage you. So, we're going to do an engagement exercise on engagement. Could I ask you to only write the answers, not the, not the full sentence, only write the answers in your little notes? So the first question or the first task is, student engagement in sustainable development is or means, you can put an explanation, you can put a key word, you can put an example. But before you do that, I also would like the same thing. Student engagement in sustainable development is not about or means or example. And I'd like you to write these in any order. So only the answers, but in any order, because then I'm going to ask you to stick your little label on yourself and to come to the front. I want everybody down at the front. Okay, we're going to play a little interactive game. But please, don't write the first part of the question or the first part of the statement, otherwise the game doesn't work. Only the last pit. And do change around which one you put on the top and which one you put on the bottom. Yeah? So let me repeat that. Answer those, those statements with an example or a word or a meaning and then put them in any order on your post-it note. As soon as you've finished, put it on yourself, on your back, on your arm, and come to the front, please. Any questions? Thank you. More post-it notes? Yes. There should be some more. There we go. There's... Thank you. There we go. Anybody else? Can you pass it back? Thank you. Sorry? Have you done yours? Yeah. I haven't written mine yet. <laughs> I'm gonna what did you say? Feelings, passion and mission. Okay. The emotional. The emotional. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Your sign and haven't lost it yet. <laughs> Please come forward. Feelings and issues. Learning stuff. Oh, Women are so powerful these days. If you have a problem of sticking this uh, to your jacket, we have helped uh, the tools. We have prepared special tools for you, so you can <laughs> use like this. Great. Just to say, when you come down, please ask five people. Uh, a minimum of five people before you sit down again, please, to see which one, if you can tell, which one's the, the not engaged and the engaged, okay? And do ask the person their name and, and where they're from and so on, please, as part of this process. Hello, I'm Daniela. <laughs> Add on. Can I ask you to take a seat, please? Can I ask you to take a seat, please? We don't want to. I know. <laughs> but Marek's telling me we need to take a seat, please. <laughs> Thank you. I know. <laughs> 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could I ask you to take a seat? Thank you. <laughs> well, let's see. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, good, good. Congratulations to your new Oh, thank you, thank you. Yes, I hope we can still work together. Yeah. Oh, will you be around for coffee? Yes. Let's have a conversation. Yes, I have a brochure about you. I saw it. Well done. Yeah, I picked one up and everything. Right, thank you very much. Marek tells me we have to speed up, otherwise I won't um, be able to sum up. Colleagues, thank you. <laughs> right here. Okay, there we go. Okay, first of all, I'm going to ask you how it was for you. Did you enjoy that? Yeah? Okay, good. See the thumbs up, right? I want to ask what you thought the serious message was behind that. Who'd like to volunteer? Serious message, over there. Can you speak loudly without a microphone? the quality of the coffee cups because the paper of the coffee cups is not totally recyclable, recycled paper. So it was a, a self-aware uh, action of our students. They didn't notify the management, they just put the things over there. Well and done. My, my facility management was not pleased, so I got an email because I'm coordinating sustainable development. So I had to write an email back instantly to the facility manager, hey Mark, we need to talk about this, that's one thing. And hey, students, keep on frustrating us with your activities. Yeah. So thank you very much for the assignment. Yeah. Okay, right. thank you. That's, that's a great. Examples are a good way of trying to illustrate. That's a very, you know, it's, it's fun to interact to meet people. It's fun to think on, on your feet. But there's actually a very serious message behind it. There's a very serious message, and that's what I really want to share with you today. And do interrupt at any point, okay? Because this is part of engagement. Interrupt, don't wait till the end. Uh, so, you know, this is the traditional way in which we do conferences and lectures. This is how I like to do teaching and learning. It's more the learning than the teaching. Uh, engagement can be fun. In higher education, we have the luxury of being able to do that. That accompanied by some reflective spaces is really important. Finding space to reflect on those experiences and that engagement is part of what I'm talking about. But sometimes engagement in classrooms, in outdoor areas, is about follow, follow these sets of questions in your nature reserve and answer them. Go and find the clues and answer them. Sometimes it's Okay, this is the topic for discussion. Go into your groups and discuss them. Great. Anything changed? Any input? Who decides the questions? That's not engagement. Group discussions without a, an underpinning questioning of how and who determines what we're engaging with is not student engagement. This reinforces my core message at the front. And I'm going to go talk through some examples of how that articulates itself in education. Those who contribute to exploiting poor, poor communities in the earth ec ecosystems are those who have those qualifications. Those who are well educated. Which says to me that getting another degree in sustainable development or doing another program on education for sustainable development is not going to change our world. However many new programs we do on environmental science, ecology, sustainability. It's not going to tackle the core issue. The core issue is that we have learning and education systems that are reproducing what is wrong with our world. 
And therefore, we need to tackle what is wrong through the way we learn and we teach. We can change content, but we have to change the process of learning and teaching. We have to challenge the power relationships. Who decides what gets taught and how, we get, how it gets taught in the classroom? And paradoxically, universities were set up, and some of them do this very well, not all of them, to actually break and change and lead. And if you, if you read all the government manifestos on higher education, as well as wanting to manage and control, they have a little thing that says universities are here so that we can break new ground, solve the problems of the world. You know, those high mission statements. But they're not doing that. <laughs> I expect you all to be independent, innovative, critical thinkers who will do exactly as I say. Here is the contradiction. Here is the paradox. We talk about sustainability. We talk about the importance of bringing change in our community, and yet our sustainable development classrooms are passing on knowledge about ecosystems, knowledge about science, knowledge about geography, not really taking that knowledge to the next step by engaging students in a way where they can connect with their locality, like Natalie was saying, making meaning in their context. Connect in their locality. Have the power to decide the type of core things that need to be learned as part of the process. So for example, um, when I do a series of, of presentations or I do a course, the core thing we ask at the start is, not what the course is going to tell you you're going to learn, but what would you like to learn or get out of this course? What would you like my role as an educator to be? Let's negotiate it. Let's negotiate what this course is going to be about and how we do the learning. And um, One of the key things that we need to challenge in the system is, yes, we pass on knowledge, we need to have processes that help students think a bit more deeply about the root causes of the issues we're facing. At one level, there's a discussion about teaching values and attitudes, which is great, but actually, we have, we, students bring values to the classroom. We need to help them unpack the onion, the layers of the onion, to get to the core of why they believe and why they value and why they think the way they do. Because if they don't understand that, they will not be in a position to challenge consumerism, climate change. If they don't understand what they value, they don't understand what they believe and why they believe it, it's very difficult to make any changes. It certainly happens with you know, certain beliefs that are very deeply held. I don't engage in understanding, understanding what those beliefs are as much as I engage in, how did you get to deeply believe in that way? Where did you, what, what experience changed you? Where did you read it? Where did you hear it? Getting an understanding of where that passion, that energy comes from is just as liberating as uh, important as understanding what your passions are. Seeing people as the problem and seeing people as agents of change. The problem solving approaches in, in schools and universities are treating people as the problem rather than saying, how can we engage constructively to make changes? The focus away from the individual and saying, what's your role in life? How do you do this? To working with students in groups in ways in which the student as a group, as a cohort, can make a change. The integration of sustainable development into the curriculum is great, but we need to innovate in the curriculum. We certainly need to move away from sending messages and negotiating our curriculum with students. Through participation. It says... See that fin, that great white shark? It's the most aggressive creature in the planet. When we do sustainability in our schools, in our classrooms, we tend to focus a lot on this relationship. But actually, what I'm saying is that this relationship here between people and our society and our expectations underpin an understanding of human and society relationships. And therefore, we must mirror that in the classroom.
The way the teacher relates to the student is an example of the type of relationships that are then mirrored outside of the classroom in their professional lives, in their family environments. And if we say we need to relate differently to each other to be able to change this, we need to mirror those changes in the relationship in the classroom. This is a big one for me. Gentlemen, charge your glasses to the future, to the future. Whatever happened to, remember the time when. The number of times I've heard the word future being used in this conference as being important to sustainable development. But do we know, do we know how to plan, how to think about the future? Or are we just saying it's important? Because the pedagogy behind futures thinking is not something I've seen yet. So although we're now at a stage we recognize it's important, do we really know how to do futures thinking? Do we know how to put the student in a position, empower them to, to influence their future? Or are we just passing on knowledge to say we have an issue here and something has to be done in the future? I said before, sustainable development, there's no clear road, there's no clear pathway. And of course, to add to that, we have these messages that are coming across that are influencing how we think and how we behave. How do we unpack these in the classroom? How do we deal with issues where we don't know the answer to them or where the answers are so complex, it's just not worth engaging with them? Well, the scenarios are that we have to deal with these. We have to deal with these important influences on education. We have to deal with them. But we need to understand the engagement. We need to understand the engagement. We need to negotiate what we're doing. I want to extrapolate that to another level. Um, a new thing that's entering our education at the moment is flexible pedagogy. What's that? I hear you say. Well, this is about the fact that there's mobile technology, computers, distance learning being more popular. This is the idea where education is changing because we have a, a choice of place where we want to learn, whether it be at home or outside or in a classroom. Mode, whether we do it through a computer or in other ways, and pace in our own time rather than the lecturer's time. You record it, you download it, you look at the lecture later. This is called flexible pedagogy. It's something that's been happening a lot. But although we're getting caught up in the technology, the technology is generating a mist at the moment, which is affecting education for sustainable development. There's technology everywhere and there's a mist that's growing up that's blurring our vision where we're not seeing the bigger picture of how our students need to engage in the power questions, the questions about relationships, power and participation in our community. We need more democratic processes. We need ways in which we engage people in a way where they can create some change and not just know that there needs to be a change. When I did my PhD, I did an okay PhD. I didn't do a great PhD, I did an okay PhD. I went to the University of Cambridge and I did an okay PhD, but I knew I'd done enough to get through. So I sat in the viva with my examiner, um, hoping to get my doctorate at the end of it. And so I thought, yeah, it's touch and go, but you know, I think I've done enough. And then the, the examiner does the killer question, you know, to which I just looked at him and went, oh. He said to me, this is good. This is all good. Could be better, but it's good. He said, but what are you going to do with it? I said, well, I'll do some publications, you know, I'll do some conferencing. That's what academics do. He said, oh, what a waste of time. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, when you finish your PhD, you'll be stuck in the University of Cambridge Library for eternity because we keep the copies forever. He said, but what if difference have you made? What difference has your research made to the world? 
I said, well, that's not up for me. That's up for the person who reads it, who uses it. He says, you're completely missing the point. The point is that you've got to engage those who you want to make changes with in the process of doing the research. You have to engage with them. You have to help. They have to help you construct the questions of the research. They need to help you collect the information. They need to help you analyze the research because that shares the power of research with those who then are going to use the research. The chances are that if you are doing research that's relevant to the needs, you're engaging and creating some ownership, the chances are they will use that research. What are the chances of them going to the University of Cambridge Library, bringing it down, reading it and doing something about it? Bang. That very moment changed my way of thinking about research and education. I had missed the point. I got my doctorate, but I had missed the point. If we're going to be making a genuine contribution, we need to think about it in terms of how we do it. How we do it. The pedagogy of learning, the pedagogy of research, the pedagogy of change. How we do it and how we learn of engaging with others to actually reach to that point. And these are the key things that I am using now for me, which I hope to share with you, and perhaps they might be helpful, or maybe you can add or generate your own. Because these are the key things that are now helping me when I'm changing this situation. So, power. Whenever I'm doing a, le a lecture, a classroom session, an a change mechanism, because part of my role in the institution is actually to change the institution. That's my role at the University of Gloucestershire. Whenever I'm doing an activity, I'm planning something, I stand back and I think, where's the power? Who has the power in this relationship? How are we going to share that power around? How are we going to involve people in generating what comes next? Connecting students to that power question and the co-creation question, co-creating together rather than passing on. And that's where the word expert goes out of the window. It's really important. And there's some really interesting ways in which we can take this forward. There's a report that's just been released by the Higher Education Academy in the UK that looks at the power in pedagogy. This one, about the future, how do we deal with that? Well, we need to start looking at methodologies in which students can create their own futures, not just predict the future, but genuinely create ways in which they can lead change. So construct, envision, think about different ways in which we could be relating to each other. Think about different ways in which we exist in this planet, live, work, but then give them the skills to be able to make those changes. So I've seen it in my university, some really good lecturers, some very good educators saying, change, 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 the change must come, the transition, the transition. Great. The students go into the workforce and go, change, 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 they last three months. Because the structures won't change because they don't know how to do the change. So they might be engaged and positive, but have they understood how change happens? Have they got the skills to bring change into the world? This is, a, this is one that goes deeply, deeply in my own heart. Reform, you see, we all talk about reform. We all talk about change, but actually I wanna talk about decolonizing education decolonizing education. We all have our histories of you know, colonial histories in many ways, you know, powers that are influencing us, that we influence. But there's so many assumptions in our content. There's so many assumptions about the examples that we use that are colonizing the way we are thinking. So we're thinking oh, with a particular set of lenses. So it's something that is very much in its infancy yet. We need to decolonize. We need to work out in our content and how we do it, whether we are being inclusive, 
whether we're using examples beyond our immediate experience as well. Of course we have to have meaning locally. Of course we have to do that. But if we just do local meaning making, we have another issue. We don't understand the bigger picture. We need to have the intercultural literacy and skills to go beyond that. The global to local is very important, really important. And as we become more global, whether we like it or not, we need to understand how the local connects with it. Thinking outside of the box is really difficult. This relates to transformative capabilities. So, we need, we've all been saying this in the conference, we all need to draw on our experience and we need to do things in a different way. We've heard that a lot, but it's actually really quite difficult. It's really difficult. And we need to have an understanding of transformative learning theories as educators in sustainable development. We need to spend more time reading and thinking and speaking to people who are engaged in transformative learning because we are trying to transform people to get to a different type of world. We need to get to that level. It looks like we hit a brick wall. I don't see a way around it. Transdisciplinarity, another word we love in ESD. We must all work across disciplines. We love it. Do we know how to? I'll give you another example. Before I came to the UK, I was actually at Macquarie University in Sydney, and I had the pleasure of working in a faculty where uh, was totally interdisciplinary. I had an architect on my left-hand side. The next room was an architect. On the other side was an archaeologist, and in front of me was a carbon mining specialist. And we all engaged in teaching the same programs. We were all engaged, supposedly, in doing research together. The reality is we didn't. We just did our classes and walked out and hoped that the student would be able to connect it together. So although that experiment was working in principle, in reality, it's very difficult to understand the frameworks and ways of thinking of colleagues who are trained in different disciplines. We need to cross those boundaries and we need to help students in the way that they are understanding a problem, an issue, a situation to cross those boundaries. Natalie was trying to do that, I think, in Cornwall, in the way that she was bringing all these different issues together. We need to find those creative ways of growing known boundary learning. That one, social learning, and of course we've got Arian here, who's one of the experts of social learning in ESD. We need to think about different ways of learning that are not classroomed, that are not institutionalized, that we learn from the social context and in the social context. It's really important for us, especially as technology is coming into play. So, another one of these charts. The key one to say is that we want to move away from teaching that informs to learning that transforms, that's the core one. And how do we do that? Well, we've got lots of jargon. Well, we need to stop and think about a situation where we have a teacher and a learner, and we have to stop and think and ask the question, where's the power? Who's got the power? Where's the choice? Who's choosing? How relevant is it to the student's experience and needs? And how do we facilitate a situation where we are learning with those students? Okay. Hey, I love being here with all the plants and animals. It's so fantastic. I think I'll stay around for a really long time. Now, let, let me just capture what's wrong, in my perspective, from the, with the education experience and how we need to transform it. A lot of our classrooms in higher education in schools are focusing on that waste and are asking the question, taking it to the laboratory and saying, doing experiments with it. How long does it take to degrade? Um, what's it made out of? You know, that sort of thing. Others are asking questions like, where is the nearest litter bin? Who dropped it there? Why did they drop it there? Let's understand the psychology of the person who dropped it there and what their motivations and thinking is. Others are saying, where's the nearest litter bin? Because that's got something to do with the geopolitics of the place. But what's the real question that we need to be asking? 
Well, the real question is, what type of society do we live in that require us to have these types of containers? What are they an indicator of? What type of governments, what type of world, uh, businesses, what type of institutions do we have that allow for these containers to exist in the first place? So you see, we're changing the questions that the students are engaging in. That student engagement questions are slightly different to the ones that we're currently engaged in. And then the question is, are we, have we got that turnaround moment to ask those deeper questions? Well, the GAP, the Global Action Program, shows some promise. It's early days to be able to say the Sustainable Development Goals and their indicators are showing some promise and I recommend you follow the progress. But ultimately, we've got a lot of work to do. We know, more or less, what needs to go in. We know what goes out. We need those examples. And here are a couple of examples that, that I want to share with you briefly. Quality and education, this is very high education, but how we can transform those people power participation questions in school as well as in higher education. These are just some examples. Um, very briefly to say that there is a consortium of educators through the University Educators for Sustainable Development Project that are looking at how educators can change that learning experience, can change the power relationships and participation. Uh, it is involving 55 universities in 30, I think it's 33 countries now. Um, and we'll, outside of the room, you can get some information on the tangible tools and experiences that are documented. We've got case studies on how that, th those relationships in the classroom can change. There's also a very powerful treaty in higher education for those who work in higher education that are outlining the guiding principles for us to work with in the classroom and to use as a checklist as we're planning. Are we really giving these sorts of important issues some thought? And finally, my final, my final slide. Important for universities and schools and education establishments to actually put sustainable development into practice in their buildings and in their facilities. But please, Please let's remember that you cannot put a lettuce in the window of a butcher shop and declare you're turning vegetarian, please. If, the, if we have a very good environmentally sustainable building we're doing the teaching in, great. But if the teaching, what we're teaching is teaching and not learning, and if, what, if the education programs of our schools, of our universities, are not challenging that participation, power and engagement, then we won't be turning vegetarian. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Comments? Yes, Herbin. Um, firstly, let me thank you very much for this uh, this, this, this wonderful uh, lecture that, that goes, again, goes everywhere and touches all kinds of things. Um, I, yesterday, in our presentation, I uh, did refer to, uh, to a philosopher, uh, Bista, um, and he has this, this statement uh, that I, I would, would invite you to reflect on about this um, empowerment and students that then can create their own future and uh, you mentioned we must uh, deconstruct in Western worldviews and according to BISTA, uh, this self-empowerment, uh, self-steering, self-awareness and so on, uh, it might be one of the parts of neoliberalism moving on towards education uh, because when everybody has this self-empowerment, has to go for himself and teachers are facilitators, then that might turn into a kind of a, 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 a rat race, so to speak. And what about the people that can't cope with that, that situation, the, the, the dropouts in that? Uh, so he, uh, he, in a way, in his philosophy, uh, is more or less against this 
too far uh, going into this self, uh, self-awareness, self-steering uh, situation. So I, I would like you to, to, to invite you to reflect uh, in, in a few words on that, uh, if, yeah. if, if possible. Yeah. Um, it's such a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, because when you start negotiating your curriculum, you start negotiating how you're going to run your time with the students. Um, you still, the, 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 the teacher still has to facilitate it in a way that generates the outcomes for the majority of the students, right? Um, so if one particular student wants to go in one particular direction, that's fantastic. But if you, all the other students don't, and you're negotiating, you have to turn it around. So that's where the neoliberalism perspective for me gets challenged, in that there's this dialectic between the power sharing. Um, you have empowerment, you, you, you know, empowerment does not mean you go over there and do whatever you want, and that's great. There's a sharing, there's a discussion, there's a dialectical relationship that needs to happen between the educator and the learner. There still needs to be a strong facilitation process that, that, that changes that learning dynamic. But, having said that, there are so, so many Western paradigms underpinning the way we do assessment, which is something I haven't even spoken about today. How we assess is just as uh, played with unsustainability as the way we teach and we learn. The hidden criteria for assessment, the types of assessment that we do, which does not capture diversity of teaching and learning styles. What we actually do assess at the end of the day and how we don't venture into you know, assessing creativity or assessing new ways into understanding issues. We don't do that. We have those traditional ways of doing things and we don't challenge it. So for me, this dialectic, this dilemma uh, between where we are now, where we need to go to, is, is a tricky one where there isn't a sort of a set of steps we follow, but one where we need to negotiate our own way with our own educators, our own education system, and not just with our students. Just to continue from there, there is one thing, uh, of course, uh, uh, teaching the teachers in a way to, to approach the issues in a different manner and, and empowering students. But there is always also the issue with students of making them wanting to do more than yes. just, you know, a yes. good PhD. Uh, yes. To, to really wanting to take this, this extra step and being creative and being yes. enforceful in a way. Yes. And, and, and it's, uh, it's again tricky. There's some students that come with uh, new world views um, that need helping. There's others who come wanting to just absorb and take away. Um, and, and don't necessarily initially like to be challenged. But once they engage in the new ways of thinking and learning, they're hooked, because I've seen it happen. I've had scenarios where I've had 30 students in a class and, you know, and the first couple of sessions, you know, they're all just going, yes, okay, this is going to be hard work. Do I really want to do this or do I drop out? You can just see it in their minds, you know, because I'm not just going to take my notes away. I'm going to have to prepare and I'm going to have to be alert and awake during the sessions because if I'm not, I'm not going to survive them. And so you can see it in their thinking that, that some of them want to step back. Some of them stick with it and do a couple of weeks. And then suddenly you could see their world just starting to change and the types of questions that they're asking of themselves, never mind of the people they're working with, also changes. And those are life-changing experiences that are documented. They then come back and they say, actually, because of this, I've done that and I've done this and I've done that. And I think it's really important for us to be risky, take those risks in education so that we can challenge the dominant paradigms of the way we do things. Yes. Any other questions? Yes, two questions. Uh, the, we gave, okay, Paula first and then there is a student behind her. Thank you, Daniela, for a nice presentation. And uh, I have one question to you. Nowadays, we, we talk very much about learning outcomes in, in, in higher education, at least, and 
trying to implement them. And I wonder if there are examples of such. I know from, well, there are learning outcomes for each individual course defined, but campus-wide, university-wide learning outcomes, I yeah. heard only of some examples of that also when it comes to sustainable development. Would that be one of the instruments if you communicate this out to the students? I mean, students vote by their feet. If they find a university or education attractive, they, they go there. So if you could uh, tell uh, or uh, yeah, communicate out uh, information about being having sustainability and the skills and the knowledge behind that as one of the guaranteed outcomes for, for the students. Would that be one way to go forward? Do you know about examples of that? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's a few examples of where institutions have very explicitly identified that their experience through higher education will generate particular graduate attributes, we call them, uh, particular ways of thinking and, and engaging. Um, we find that, that students, it doesn't mean anything to them really. Um, it means more to the institution that it's committing itself, but students just look at the concepts and go, what's this mean? Um, until they actually live it in the classroom, until they actually s experience it, it doesn't really mean anything. So it becomes more of a propaganda thing for institutions uh, if it goes externally. I do find it very valuable for it to be used as a basis for conversations in teaching and learning committees or in quality assurance processes or uh, in institutions, having those very explicitly identified as something that an institution is committing to, then they're very useful there. But not, students not wanting to engage is a really interesting question. Um, some come to university because they just want to get a degree, they just want to take away that certificate. Some of them come because they just want to have the higher education experience of living alone, interacting with others. And then there's a small number that come because they want to change the way they experience life. And so the challenge of the educator is to actually extend that number of people when they come in so that that transformation of the way they themselves see the world, the way they engage with the world happens, so that, so that they become part of a new sustainable future rather than part of the problem of unsustainability. It's a big challenge. I think Monica over there as well. Um, hello, um, I'm Sashko. We talked a bit on the, on the stage. Um, but uh, maybe I can just use this three seconds to ask um, to the audience, actually, like how many of you are actually students? That's great to see. Um, and I'm also a student um, at Uppsala University uh, in Sweden, in Uppsala. And I would just like to comment that this is exactly um, what my, the department that I study at and also work at now um, called CEMUS, C-E-M-U-S. CEMUS, uh, it's a Swedish abbreviation of Center of Studies of uh, Environment and Development Studies. And um, we are a student-driven uh, education model um, that students like me get hired to coordinate the courses to offer at bachelor's level and at a uh, master's level. And so this question of, you know, all these questions that you, uh, or, and also elements that you have mentioned is, is such a crucial issue. Me, uh, myself, coordinating a course as a student, um, think about a lot, how do you share the power? How do you, as a student, also act in the classroom as a coordinator, so, so as a facilitator? And so I, I would just like to invite you all to um, join the discussions and um, especially the students to actively join the, the rest of the discussions today. Thank you for that. There's one there. Um, just a very short one. Very, very shortly, please. Thank you. It will be very, very short. And thanks for a fantastic lecture. But a short question. How to make the university uh, authorities and engaged in ESD. This is a big problem. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just like students, uh, they have to go through a learning journey. Uh, and 
what I what I have learned in my last eight years at Gloucestershire is that making a business case and, and talking through does not help. However many people say you've got to have the business case to make changes to leaders, they, they, they won't. You have to plan a learning journey for them. You have to work out where they are <laughs> and then provide a series of interventions and a series of learning opportunities because uh, the one-off conversation is not going to change someone's mind and put in place a series of things which will hopefully, if they're done right and if the moment is timed right, will lead to that change. I had a vice, I, I was recruited to come and do institutional change by a wonderful vice chancellor. She lasted a year. She then left and they brought in this gentleman who was a complete cynic of sustainable development. He did not believe in it in any way, shape or form. And so we had a challenge because here we had a team of 30 people engaged in sustainable development in the institution and a vice chancellor who didn't believe in it. I very quickly realized my 30 strong team would probably be turning down to two or even nothing by the end of the year if things hadn't changed. So we planned and mapped a step-by-step -step process of influencing his thinking. <laughs> and we said, okay, where is he in the learning journey? These are the assumptions he's making. This is the, we listened to him first. We spoke to him. He said, this is my understanding. This is why I don't believe in it. This is the things I find challenging. You know, okay. So we started planning a series of activities. And I have to say, not, not all of us were engaged in the activity. So we brought in colleagues from outside the university who he had the ear of, who he respected. And we spoke to them and said, can you help us move this vice chancellor's thinking along and help him, can you please help us challenge his way of thinking? We're not asking you to shape his thinking, we're just asking him to ask some questions about his thinking and engage in this learning process. So we counted on the external stakeholders, on you know internal stakeholders, on the students, those who were very passionate about it, and we constructed a context for the vice chancellor to learn in and to understand. He's now been there for seven years, and he is our biggest passionate component for sustainability. He cycles into work, and when we have executive meetings, he sits there and says, where's the sustainability in here? He doesn't completely understand it very deeply, but he understands how important it is now. Uh, and, and so there has been a, you know, a, a big of a U-turn, but it was because we planned a learning journey. We didn't do the traditional, here's the business plan, here's why you must do it. We understood he had to go through a process just like our students did. Does that answer your question?